I'm very happy to be here today and share some of my work on Grace Paley, um, who actually was of Ukrainian descent. Um, I haven't done so much research about her family background, but I think it could be very interesting to think about in the context of um, the fascinating previous talk. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Great. Um, okay, so writing throughout much of the 20th century and producing three volumes of well-known short stories, insightful and unconventional poetry and numerous essays, Grace Paley often offers her readers texts subverting heteronormative concepts and ideas while writing and thinking about women's lives as mothers, partners, feminists, and activists. Born in 1922, Paley's status as a woman and a daughter of Ukrainian Jewish immigrants, um, as well as her starting point as a writer and her point of view, were tied to her double societal marginalization. This posi position significantly influenced her turning to storytelling, a practice not only tied to her Jewish heritage, but also linked to women's cultural identities and histories around the world. This embracing and utilizing of oral tradition influenced Paley's undermining of widely accepted societal norms and preconceptions prevalent in the more popular and critically acclaimed literary works of her generation. Along with the effects of her family's immigrant background on her work, the consequences of her status of a woman, woman writer beginning to publish much of her work in the late 1950s are apparent in her writing, as Paley dedicated much of her work over the years to women's lives and struggles. As Jacqueline Taylor notes, quote, convinced that women's lives were common and important, she created her first stories out of a desire to understand and record the lives of women around her, end quote. In this sense, the departure from patriarchal oriented narrative, which can be clearly read in her work, can also be linked to a more general reading of her alternative poetics, which is demonstrated by Taylor, lead to a unique style of writing that departs from androcentric narrative, creating characteristics of its own and drawing on and extending a woman-focused oral narrative tradition. As Taylor notes, beginning with what she called the dark lives of women, Paley draws on and extends a woman oral narrative tradition that ignores dominant concerns with dramatic conflicts, point making and heroism in order to feature the emotional content of ordinary experience, celebrate the connections that unite people to one another and memorialize and make sense of the events of everyday life. In the process, she not only reveals connections between women's orality and women's literacy, she also transforms the dominant narrative strategies that shape our beliefs about what stories can be told. In fact, although Paley's authorial voice was also recognizably part of a larger shift in US literature, or as Julian Levinson describes it, the Jewish American Renaissance of post-war United States, as Taylor demonstrates, Paley's position as a writer influenced by her double marginalization led her to adopt and explore an unconventional and singular narrative of her own. Indeed, women of the post-war era marrying and giving birth in the 1940s and 50s were influenced by cultur cultural circumstances in the United States, idealizing, idealizing heteronormative family life and womanhood in the years leading up to the realizations of the feminine mystique. As Betty Friedan describes the dominant concern shaping women's lives in the 1940s and 1950s, over and over again, Stories in women's magazines insist that women can know fulfillment only in the moment of giving birth to a child. They deny the years where she can no longer look forward to giving birth, even if she repeats the act over and over again. In the feminine mystique, there is no other way for a woman to dream of creation of, or of the future. There is no other way she can, give dream, she can even dream about herself except as her children's mother, her husband's wife. Um, and this is just sort of a visual representation of what heteronormativity um, looked like in the 1940s and 50s. I'm sure most of you have seen these images since they were very popular at the time. Um, this reality, of course, is a result of specific gender norms of this generation that we have come to understand through Judith Butler's work as, um, and quote, identity tenuously constant. Uh, sorry, Sh Shira, I think your PowerPoint is not going further. We cannot see, we see always the first uh, slide. 
Oh, okay. Um, thank you for telling me. Uh, <laughs> try to stop sharing and share again because yeah, they, perfect. Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Let's try again. Um, all right. So this is the first slide. Can you see anything now? Only the first one with a title. Hmm. Um, and how about now if I just keep it like this? Yes, it's... now it changes, yes. Okay, so I have to stay out of the slideshow mode, but I think we can just do it this way. Yes. Um, so this was, I'll just go over the slides for a second. These were her uh, books, and this is Paley herself. Um, and this was a quote from Jacqueline Taylor, and this was the one from the Feminine Mystique. And this was the image I was talking about, uh, right, as representing heteronormativity um, in the 1940s and 50s. Um, so you can see all of them, right? Yes, yes, very okay. clear. Great. Um, so I'll continue this way. Um, so we said, right, Judith Butler. Um, in this sense, Paley's representation of womanhood and motherhood is unstable and unconforming to the constructs affecting women of her generation, undermines the imperative of uh, continuing this role and offers an attempt at reshaping it. This undoing calls for a, re a reclaiming and creating a new language and new modes of expression and enables a generating of alternative uh, modes of narrative. Um, so now to goodbye and good luck, the story. Many scholars have noted the disruption of hegemonic narrative in one of Paley's first and best known stories, Goodbye and Good Luck, first published in 1959. As Taylor has written in, this con in the context of this story, the and androcentric language is explicitly presented and explicitly responded to in the text. Indeed, the whole premise of this piece, featuring an older aunt telling the story of her life to her niece, presenting her with non-traditional choices as to love and marriage, and being herself a non-traditional heroine, undermines social conceptions prevalent at the time as to the way women should conduct their lives. In the discussion of the story, I will demonstrate how through Rose, the narrator slash storyteller, the narrative presented in this text subverts and disrupts the traditional patriarchal narrative on a number of different levels, and particularly in relation to the narrator's body. In her role as storyteller, Rose not only controls the narrative in terms of the direction of the plot, but shapes it in her image. An older Jewish woman who is an immigrant and speaks in a dialect heavily influenced by Yiddish. In this sense, she allows for deviation from the subversion of the common and well uh, accepted patriarchal cause, sorry, the deviation and the This cause and effect is apparent in the concept of the earlier marriage plot, common to 19th century English literature, but relevant in Paley's, to gen, Paley's generation as well, which refers to on the most basic level, the narrative that ends in marriage and is largely concerned throughout with courtship without many options of alternative processes or outcomes. In this respect, the subversion of dictates regarding feminine, feminine reality is apparent here in the character's alternative life choices. Additionally, it can be discovered in Paley's positioning as Ro of Rose as a representative of an alternative lineage. As described by Shana Hammerman and Naomi Seidman, sorry, as described by Shana Hammerman and Naomi Seidman. Finally, as I will argue, based on the work of Lucy Rigueray and Helen Sixou, the representations of the narrator's body within the text create a female-centered uh, narrative and experience in a setting where these options are not readily available to her. In this sense, Rose and Paley find themselves in the same sort of situation, a woman in a man's world trying to pave a new path, which has been trod by few women before them. In Rose's, cases, in Rose's case, it's a financial and familial independence. In Paley's case, it is writing. This position can account for the subversive elements which appear in the style of the writing of the story. In the story, the aunt, Rose, tells her niece Lily of her relationship with a married man a famous Yiddish actor by the name of Lodia Vlashkin. The Rose breaks off the relationship because, as she puts it, quote, I am no homebreaker, end quote. Many years later, after his wife divorces him, Vlashkin tracks her down and they become engaged to be married. Even though at first it seems that the message Rose is conveying to her niece is that she has finally achieved the traditional happy ending for women, which is to marry a man, the story holds within it messages of more complexity. 
For one thing, Taylor announced the power of the ironic and humorous undertones of Paley's style in this text. Um, as she writes, by ending in Rosie's marriage, this story replays uh, one of the conventional narrative endings for females, but it does so with a degree of self-irony that functions to subvert the power of this outcome. In its, in its explicit naming of narrative convention, it manifests a consciousness of that convention that undermines its power. Another example of this is Rose's statement after telling Lily to pass on to her mother that she will have a husband. She says, which as everybody knows, a woman should have at least once before the end of the story. But as Taylor points out, obviously the traditional happy ending in marriage requires that the woman have at most one husband rather than at least one. Um, furthermore, as Taylor observes, the classic rules of narrative convention do not apply to Rose in this case. As she writes, love her uh, for years to a married man, Rosie should, according to narrative convention, end in ruin. Instead, she has the excitement and independence of her early years and marriage for love in her old age. Additionally, Rose's refusal to marry after her parting with Vashkin, her independence and her self-sufficiency expressed by her move out of her mother's house and her decision to support herself financially, lead her to a situation in which she is freed, at least to a certain extent, from the restriction uh, restricting roles and positions allocated to women of her generation by society. These choices open up additional possibilities beside matrimony and child rearing. For herself and perhaps for the next generation of women's, women represented by her niece Lily. In between aunt and niece, Grace Paley and the Jewish American Swerve, Hammerman and Seidman offer an additional example of the way in which this story represents an alternative to an androcentric worldview. They illuminate, illuminate the diagonal connection between aunt and niece and expand upon the way in which this provides us with the tools to trace the inherited, inherited the trans Jewish cultural legacies that energize and distinguish Pitty's work. The two base their analysis of the aunt niece relationship on Viktor Shiklovsky model called the Knight's Moon. Um, Hammerman and Seidman use the concept of queer theory in this analysis as a tool which offers an understanding of the family as a social construction and suggests that within the changing, uh, this la changing landscape, childless aunts and bachelor uncles might be particularly good to think with neutralizing the family from within and reconfiguring lineage as consent rather than descent. In this sense, the character of Rose is a representative of an alternative familial lineage, undermining a notion of reality in which a nuclear male-dominated family and the patriarchal word are the only socially accepted options. An additional close reading of the story focusing on the appearance of the female body within the text bring up another aspect of the manner in which the narrative in this piece deviates from heteronormative content and style and highlights the appearance of women-centered writing and expression. To my knowledge, this theme has not been explored within the context of Paley's work in general and this story in particular. In the tradition of Irigaray and Sixou, I would like to propose that the appearance of the body on different levels within the story add yet another dimension to the story's positioning as undermining male-centered narrative in that it exposes and reaffirms feminine subjectivity. This begins with descriptions in which the female body is positioned as accessible to a male-driven practice of claiming it as a target of sexual desire. This attitude is represented by Rose's boss, Mr. Krimberg, in expressions like, immediately he said, Rosie Lieber, you surely got a build on you. Or a young lady lacking fore and aft, her blood has, um, is so busy warming the toes and fingertips, it don't have time to circulate where it's most required. This approach is also apparent in the options open to young women of Rose's generation as presented by the four women of her first, in her, at her first place of work. If you can't sit, girly, she says politely, go stand in the street corner, alluding, of course, to the option of prostitution. From here, the references to the body and Rose's personal body in particular um, change throughout the story. For example, the following description appears in the context of her first meeting with Blaschke. And you, Rose, you know, you have such a nice hand, so warm to the touch, such a fine skin. Tell me, why do you wear a scarf around your neck? You only hide your young, young throat. These are not olden times, my child, to live in shame. It was ashamed, I said, taking off the kerchief. But my hand right away went to the kerchief's place, because the truth is, it really was olden times, and I was still in a, of a nature to melt with shame. 
This passage works well as a representation of the attempted patriarchal control over the feminine body, both from Blaskin, who tries to gain more access to the body as an object of sexual desire, and from society, which shapes Rose's shame and control in regards to her own body. In this sense, the term olden times expresses societal norms and regulations, but at the same time, Rose's control over her own body begins to appear. This representation of the feminine body corresponds with ideas from uh, L'Ecriture Feminine, as Anne Rosalind Jones describes it. She notes that Irigara and Sixou, Sixou um, emphasize that women, women historically limited to being sexual objects for men, virgins or prostitutes, wives, wives or mothers, have been prevented from expressing their sexuality in itself or for themselves. If they can do this, and if they can speak about it in a new language it calls for, they will establish a point of view, a site of difference, from which phallocentric concepts and controls can be seen through and taken apart, not only in theory, but also in practice. Indeed, Shelley constructed it, the story is filled with Rose's references to her own body. She first describes herself as, I was no thinner than, only more stationary in the flesh. And later on in the story adds, I put this to show, in to show you, your fat old aunt was not crazy out of loneliness. Rose also refers to herself as a lady, what they call fat and 50 as well as stating that my health, considering the weight it must carry, is first class. Although when first reading these descriptions, they may appear to be as self-denigrating when we judge them in the context of societal norms in which being older and overweight are considered shameful and devaluing, I would like to suggest that this tactic used by the narrator may be a way of detaching the female body from the price tag of sexual desirability placed upon it by hegemonic-based norms. By describing herself thus, Rose separates her status as a woman about to be married from the objectification normally attributed to women in the situation. Up until this day, but most definitely in the 1950s when Paley was writing this story. And thus liberates herself further from the marriage plot and all it entails. This clear differentiation between the patriarchal attitudes towards the feminine body, as opposed to the pre oedipal understanding of it, is apparent in this ne next paragraph as well, describing the conversation between Rose and Vlashkin. I took one look and I said to myself, where did the Jewish boy grow up so big? Just outside of Kiev, he told me. How? My mama nursed me till I was six. I was the only boy in the village to have such health. My goodness, Vlashkin, six years old? She must have had shredded wheat there, not rest, poor woman. My mother was beautiful, he said. She had eyes like stars. While Vlashkin romanticizes this act of breastfeeding, turning his mother's body into an object of beauty to be admired, Rose offers a counter-patriarchal interpretation, pulling this image down to earth and pointing out the real pain and disfigurement which accompanied this mythic, unattainable image of womanhood and mother. This act corresponds once more with Rigueray and Sixou's philosophy, as explained by Jones. As she says, if women are to discover and express who they are, um, to bring to the surface what masculine history has repressed in them, they must begin with their sexuality. And their sexuality begins with their bodies, with their genital, with their genital and libidinal difference from men. Considering this theoretical approach, the female body and its appearance and representations in this story seem to very clearly support a process of reclamation of narrative by the female uh, protagonist slash narrator slash storyteller. This allows not only for disruption of male-oriented language, but for a non-verbal pre oedipal form of expression, offering an alternative side of subjectivity and agency for the woman telling the story, as well as for the women reading and listening to it. In this concept, context, it's interesting to note Rose's description of her own father when trying to explain her mother's objection to her love affair. She says, she married who she did not like, a sick man, his spirit already swallowed up by God. He never washed, he had an unhappy smell. His teeth fell out, his hair disappeared, he got smaller, shriveled up little by little. Till goodbye and good luck, he was gone and only came to mama's mind when she went to the mailbox under the stairs to get the electric bill. In this description, Rose's father's body goes through a process of disappearing, and in this sense can as well be read as a representation of defying patriarchy. Since if Paley's introduction of the feminine body into play can be read as, read as a symbol of undermining hegemonic narrative, the shrinking and vanishing of the male body must surely contribute to this process as well. Um, indeed, Paley's unique style of writing, departing from and rethinking hegemonic-inspired literary expression, 
is fertile grounds for thinking more deeply about representations of women's bodies and the implications of an alternative approach to the way women experience themselves in the world. If, as for them, had limited options of what they could do or even how they could think about their bodies, Paley's literary voice was an important reminder of the fact that this reality could be changed. And indeed, through her writing and unconventional characters, Paley was part of a movement in writing and beyond, liberating the female body through highlighting oppression and limitation and offering alternative possibilities and options for expression and existence. Thank you.